And on 51, then, he pursues this thought a little bit more. So the value of some means is derived from how effective it is at getting something you desire. So something is more valuable if it is very effective at satisfying your desire. It's also more valuable if it's effective at getting something you really desire. You have a very strong desire for it. That's something that's very, very good. So, so the value of some means derives from how effective it is at satisfying our desires, achieving the ends that we desire, and strength of those desires. So this applies not just to education and money. This applies to people also. The value of a person for Hobbes derives from the instrumental contribution that he could make to my ability to satisfy my desires. That's how much I will value a person. How much contribution they will make to satisfying my desires. And a measure of that, a way of measuring how much I value a person, how much I judge their contribution to satisfying my ends. Way of measuring that is to see what I would be willing to give up to acquire those means. In other words, the price, what I would be willing to pay. And this is exactly what Hobbes says, um, paragraph 16 on page 51, a famous passage. He says, the value or worth of a man is, as of all other things, his price. That is to say, so much as would be given for the use of his power. And therefore, the value of a person, he says, is not absolute, but a thing dependent on the need and judgment of another. Well, of course, the value of a person is a subjective, uh, is derived from a subjective account of value, the value of anything is going to be derived from somebody's point of view based on the desires that they have. So the value of a person is going to be based on the contribution that they can make to satisfying somebody's desires. And look, the, the point is that they may have different values for different people, depending on what different people's desires are. Uh, if I have a particular skill, I can um, build wheels really well. Well, what's the value? What's my value to you? Well, depends how valuable wheels are to you. It depends whether you have a desire that can be satisfied effectively with wheels. If not, I'm not very valuable at all. If you do have that desire, I'm very valuable. Okay, so different people, so the value of anything is going to be relative to different people um, and the desires that they have. Um, is that clear? Questions about that? So this idea that, I mean, this idea that the value of a person is derived in this instrumental way, just like the value of anything, um, is something that we'll, we'll see is in very, very sharp contrast to Kant, who thinks that people have value that's not simply instrumental. Um, and you might say Marxists would play this kind of passage up as something about the triumph of market values over intrinsic human worth. Right? So 
we can, Marxists would say, that in this passage, and others, you can see the ideology of market values right here on the surface. I think there's something to that. But I also want you to recognize that this idea of, of, of value being based on the desires that people have also really is a subversive notion. And you should think of it in, in this way also. What Hobbes is saying here is that the value, that value, including the value of birth, is set not by God, but by us. So the value of an object, including the value of a person, is something that has to prove its worth to us. Isn't set in the nature of things by God. And in particular, the crucial case that he's going to worry about here is, anybody want to guess? There's going to be one case that, um, beyond all others, is, is going to be the relevant one. The value of the sovereign, the value of the commonwealth, has to be proven to all of us. A, a, a king, a sovereign, a form of government, is not set by God as the objectively correct one. It's something that has to be proven, has to be established by showing that it will help us satisfy our desires. So this is a radical notion. We, as it were, are the source of value. And, and mere commodities and people and kings have to be assessed in terms of their ability to satisfy our desires. Okay, uh, finishing up here. Um, Skip. I have a couple points to make about chapter 11. <coughs> so here, in the first paragraph on page 57, we get finally an explicit statement where he says that there is no such thing as finis ultimus, or summum bonum. There is no highest good. This is on 57. So this is the first paragraph of chapter 11. And this is no surprise, right? We've been saying that there's no objective good independent of the desires that we have to have, so there is no highest end that is objectively good toward which we are all striving. Um, so the problem, though, is that we have our desires change. And so what we take to be valuable changes. This is what he says um, further down on 57. He says, um, the problem is that the object of man's desires is not to enjoy once only and for one instant of time, but to assure forever the way of his future desires. So we know that we will have desires in the future. Sorry, go back. We have desires now. Those desires are toward certain objects. We call those ends good. But we also know that if we were to achieve those ends, satisfy our desires, we would have new desires, new things that we would call good. And we would be striving to achieve them also. Our desires change, are fluid. This is something I tell my husband almost every day. <laughs> um, and this means that there will, for Hobbes, this means that forever and inevitably there will be conflicts among desires. Different people will, from time to time, have desires that conflict with one another. Because our desires are fluid. 
Our desires are not set and permanent so that once they're satisfied, we have no more. And this means, as I say again, that there will be conflict. And therefore, he says, let's just continue. And therefore, uh, the voluntary actions and inclinations of all men tend not only to the procuring, but also in the assuring of a contented life. And they differ only in the way by which to achieve the satisfaction of their desires. Which uh, ariseth partly from the diversity of passions in diverse men, and partly from the difference in the knowledge um, and, or opinion each one has of the causes which produce the effect of desire. So in the first, in paragraph two now, so I'm at the top of page 58. So that in the first place I put for general inclination of all mankind, a perpetual and restless desire of power after power that ceaseth only in death. And the cause of this is not always that a man hopes for a more intensive delight than he has already attained, or that he cannot be contented with moderate power, but because he cannot assure the power and means to live well, which he hath present, which we already have, without the acquisition of more because our desires are fluid and we know that we're going to have more desires to be satisfied in the future. So we get, so we get, so we get perpetual and restless desire of power after power that ceases only in death. What's power mean here? Means. Means. The means. Power is the means to satisfy our desire. One possible means is to control somebody else, for sure. But that's not all he means here. So it's not only, it includes, but it's not only power over other people. Other people can be means. Um, okay. So here at least, um, power is, as I say, instrumental to um, our ground level desires. Hobbes is not saying in passage like this, he's not saying that we have an in-